So can you can you share your? We are my computer is is not. And no, we yes, we can see it now. But it, there's quite a delay, so we'll see how well that works. Yes. See the slideshow so, mode now? Yeah, we can see the slideshow. So, okay. David, when you want, please thank you very much to be with us today. Thank you. Okay. Very much, Nuno. And hello, everybody. I hope you're all doing well under the difficult circumstance. I would like to thank Nuno for the kind invitation. And thank you for joining me today on this uh, very interesting topic of which I can only share a very brief overview. I also want to acknowledge uh, several of my Keysight colleagues and also some of the uh, eminent researchers who are true world experts in the field with whom I've had the pleasure of, of learning little tidbits. So here's how I plan to organize the talk. I'll start with some of the claims about the wonders of quantum computation, should they be realized. And you'll, you'll see what all the excitement is about. But I'll spend most of the talk talking about how microwaves and microwave engineering has the potential to this to become a reality. So I'll talk about qubits, the fundamental unit of quantum information, and give you a, a very little flavor about uh, quantum algorithms and how they work. And then I'll try to summarize. And if the point of the joke is not quite evident, I hope it will be more clear at the end of the talk. Technology of which quantum computing on the is a major part, has the potential to transform our society as profoundly as any technological revolution in our history, in my opinion. So in quantum mechanics has the ability in principle to guarantee secure and private communication. At the same time, paradoxically, the power of quantum communication enables, in principle, the uh, some of our classical security apparatus. So in, uh, by factoring large numbers, we can potentially break uh, some of the in encryption protocols. And that, of course, is why so many of the governments in the world are spending so much money, as well as some of the opportunities to help humanity, such as simulate uh, chemical more accurately designed drugs and sense things at exquisite uh, sensitivities. So the, it's, it's really quite impressive what some of the possibilities are. But why are we talking about this now? Well, you've seen about in many different ways. And here I'm just plotting the critical dimension of transistors as a function of time and it's, they're getting smaller exponentially. And already we're below 10 nanometers. And in two more orders of magnitude, we'll be down at the size of a single atom, a tenth of a nanometer or an angstrom. So a classical transistor can't work as a single atom. And all the hoops that the foundries have been going in to try to preserve Moore's law longer and longer will eventually have to come to an end when we're dealing with the classical parallelization. So things like threshold voltages are getting harder to control as the number of atoms in the transistor basically decreased. So this is a fundamental paradigm change really being forced on us now, but the idea really came, that uh, Feynman came up with in the mid 80s was, well, why not 
stop fighting the inevitable and instead try to harness the wonderful and unique properties of quantum mechanics for computation. And that has really kind of wonderful scientific and technological breakthroughs that you're about to witness and have already. Historians of this area draw parallels between where we are now in quantum computation and where the semiconductor industry was somewhere in the 30s to 50s when the fundamental came out of the academic labs, Bell Labs, and moved west and started uh, Silicon Valley, for example. So it's an exciting time. So with that introduction, let me move on to some of the basics of qubits and look for some of these prints. And I will only be able to go through them very uh, quickly and not as deeply as they should be treated. Classical bits, they can take a value of zero or one. And the quantum mechanical version of that is a qubit, quantum bit. And it's often said colloquially, a qubit can be in any state in between zero and one inclusive. But a more precise statement would be that a qubit is an ideal two-level quantum mechanical system that can be in an arbitrary complex superposition of two basis states, which we call ket zero. So we can label these two orthogonal unit vectors in an abstract space, just like x hat and y hat are unit vectors in the plane. And the state, the most you can know about a, a qubit, this two ideal two-level system, is can be any superposition of those two. There's one constraint on the coefficients, which are complex numbers, namely the sum of the absolute squares is one. And that constraint means we can parameterize these numbers in terms of the standard spherical angles. The state of a qubit then can be visualized as being any point on the surface of this sphere of radius one. That's called the block sphere. And we can associate at the north and south poles, respectively, the two different basis states, ket zero and ket one. So unlike a bit that can be one of two values, there is an infinite continuous set of quantum states that can be associated with the qubit. Now, an example of this ideal system, or for example, an electron, a free electron in a magnetic field, photons, for example, uh, let's take polarization. That the, let's say, vertical and horizontal, you can think of those as the zero and one, for example, or cir right circularly polarized light and left circularly polarized light. For the electron in a magnetic field, it's spin up and spin down. So those are the two different basis states. Uh, realistically, in systems now, we're talking about uh, macroscopic objects like Josephson, et cetera. But we'll just uh, use one example given the time. Now, we talked about the state of a qubit being any super. In addition to that, though, when you actually query a qubit, when you look at it or when you measure it, you get only one of two possible outcomes. So no matter what beta are, assuming they're both not zero or, or one isn't zero, you can get this state, get zero or one. You can get, for example, In your polarizers, you get either vertical or horizontal, for example, or circularly polarized right or left, uh, nothing in between. So that's very important because you can only retrieve then one classical bit of information when you measure a qubit, despite the fact that these coefficients can be anything and there can be infinite precision to them, therefore infinite information. You can only retrieve 
one classical bit. So that's not very useful. And the, when you measure the qubit, you get then the collapsing to either zero or one, depending on what you get. And that's called the collapse of the wave function. Now there's a little bit more to the state and its relationship to these measurements. It turns out that the absolute square of these coefficients will actually give you the probability of getting the result that you found. Now, from a single, you cannot tell what these coefficients are. You have to repeat the experiment over and over and over again and make a measurement each time and then build up the statistics to get the values of at least the magnitude of alpha and beta. Data. And that's because fundamental to quantum mechanics. It has nothing to do with lack of information about initial conditions. It is an inherent property of nature. So philosophically, people used to say, well, the scientific actually on the fact that if you set up an experiment the same way and repeat it, you have to get the same answer. That is absolutely not true. You can define or prepare a qubit in exactly the same state, make a measurement and get a different result. All you can predict are the probabilities. Now let's make our way towards a real qubit. And we're gonna start with a familiar LC linear electrical oscillator with an inductor and a capacitor. We can write the energy of this circuit in terms of the charge stored capacitor and the flux through the inductor this way. And as a function of charge flux, we call that the Hamiltonian. That's an exact mathematical ana analogy with a particle subject to a parabolic potential or linear restoring force, mass spring system from mechanics, and we know that the classical energy in terms of the momentum and the coordinates, we replace the momentum of classical physics with minus h bar d by dx, a differential operator, and the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation is a value equation, just like uh, many of it those equations that we, we know from engineering. And it has solutions at discrete energy levels labeled by the integer n. And here is Planck's constant. And that's how we get the allowed energy in quantum mechanics. And so unlike a cloud particle in a parabolic potential, here's the parabolic potential, the classical particle can have any energy depending on its initial position or, and momentum, for example. But in quantum mechanics, the solution of Schrodinger's eigenvalue equation says there are only discrete energy levels allowed. And in this case, they are equally spaced by an energy of h bar omega, where omega, not too surprisingly, is the frequency of the LC oscillator, one over LC, as is familiar. But this is not yet a qubit. Remember, I said a qubit is an ideal two-level system, infinite number of levels. So we have to do something else. So what we do is replace the fixed induct value with a nonlinear inductor. And fortunately, there is a nonlinear inductor that's also dissipationless, that's critical, in the Josephson junction. And a Josephson junction is just a sandwich of some kind of insulator by two superconducting pieces of metal. And then a Cooper pairs a tunnel back and forth. And it behaves as a nonlinear oscillator. That's all I'm going to say about the physics there. But because it's nonlinear, the energy is no longer exactly quadratic in the flux or the phase, as to next order, a quartic term, and there are other higher order terms that detract from the parabola of the potential energy. 
So instead of the dashed parabola, we get a curve that flattens out. And that changes the solution of Schrodinger's equation because it's a different system and produces the discrete but anharmonic LC oscillator spectrum. And because we can tune our microwaves to this transition, so one of the key enabling relationships of microwaves to these systems, we can our attention to these lower two levels, and that gives us a good approximation to an ideal qubit. Now, quantum mechanics to the operation of this computational paradigm, and in order to preserve the discrete quantum nature of the system, we have to make sure that the thermal energy of the environment does not incoherently mix these levels. We have to be able to coherently manipulate transitions between the two levels of qubits in order to do anything useful. And to see how cold we actually have to make the, we first notice that the energy difference typically in these superconducting qubits typically in the 10 gigahertz range or anywhere from one to, to 10 typically. And in terms of the frequency, which we can get by dividing or, or ter in terms of the energy, we multiply by H bar and there's an effective temperature, which we can calculate given Boltzmann's constant. And we see that corresponding to the transition frequency of 10 gigahertz microwaves is half a degree Kelvin. So it's very cold. And if we want this to this temperature energy to be small compared to the energy difference of the quantum states, we actually have to operate down in the one to 10 to 20 millikelvin range now, for cold. It's much colder than outer space. Remember, there's a three degree background microwave radiation signature in space and the orders of magnitude colder. So that's one of the many challenges. So try to sprinkle the comments about the challenges, keeping things really cold and making systems work at these frigid temperatures is, is a big challenge. Now it's not enough just to have these levels. We have to be able to initialize them. We have to be able to coherently go from one level to and therefore we make these uh, qubits uh, microwave circuits. So this looks just like a microwave circuit. Here's a resonator, here's a readout line. Uh, there are capacitors here and the circuit is actually shown uh, blown up here. It's very small and there's a, a loop in a superconducting quantum interference device to enable a tuning of these levels by changing the magnetic flux through the, uh, the superconducting device. And couple through uh, lines to the resonator, we'll talk about that a little bit more, and then provide microwave pulses, which will manipulate the states of the qubit. So again, it's not enough to have levels. We have to be able to set the qubit into one of these an initial condition, coherently manipulate with microwaves, which are then sent in here from a source, and then be able to measure the qubits, which we'll see we can do that by querying the resonator, which is coupled to the uh, quantum mechanical device here. It's, it's also therefore clear from the diagram and from what I've just mentioned that microwave engineering is really incredibly useful. The physicists are, are kind of begging us to help them with design and applying some of the knowledge of our society to help them of engineer and produce and design these chips. Zooming out from that previous picture is this uh, pretty picture from UCSB, the Martinez group. Here are five of those qubits called transmons or exmons for obvious reasons. 
Here are the resonators. Each resonator is attached to uh, one of the qubits in these cases. Sometimes you can multiplex them. Uh, these lines provide the microwave control to manipulate the quantum state on the block sphere as well as the tuning of the energy level difference. And again, you can recognize the microwave characteristics of these quantum chips. What's potentially different is that the chip has to live at these at very, very cold temperatures at the bottom of what's called a dilution refrigerator. It's a cryostat in this encasement. It often is a, a huge cylindrical device hanging from the ceiling above the lab. And you see all these microwave cables. They're typically three cables per qubit. So it's a tangled mess of equipment. There are also there are filters and circulators and parametric amplifiers and all kinds of microwave uh, equipment at different stages here. And we, there's 77 Kelvin here, sometimes four Kelvin in the middle and down here, uh, the millikelvin temperature. So there are all kinds of challenges. And scalability, trying to get many, many qubits, as we'll see, which are needed to do useful computations, makes this kind of connectivity very difficult. So one of the big challenges in the field is how can this system be scaled to hundreds or thousands or millions of fully functioning qubits? So I want to now show a little video, if it works, about microwave signals using a source and a mixer. To, uh, actually, the quantum state on the block sphere. So we're going to be starting, say, in this case, let's say the ground state of this two-level system. And depending on the phase, or the say whether it's an I or in the Q channel, and the pulse, we will be performing rotations from one point on the surface of the block sphere to another. That's how we manipulate the quantum state. And I hope it will work. So we're now doing a rotation all the way to the bottom, ket one, changing the phase, going back to the ground state, now rotating around the y axis. And now rotating halfway back. So we're at the equator, rotating another halfway back around the y axis to the top. So by changing the amplitude and the phase of our microwave signals applied at the resonance frequency of the qubit, that's key, we can manipulate the quantum state determinist from wherever we started from to wherever we want it to go. That of where we want it to go depend on the algorithm. Uh, it's important to know that yes, system it's uh, probabilistic, but the Schrodinger equation is a linear uh, differential equation. And if you don't measure, if you close your eyes and don't look, you can control the state of the qubit to turn because the Schrodinger equation evolves deterministically. All right, I'm not gonna show it again. Oops. All right, so here's a simple circuit, quantum circuit diagram. Very briefly to review what we just saw in the movie. We start the qubit in state and we apply a microwave pulse the first blue pulse say in the i channel flip into its excited state and that was equivalent to a rotation around the x axis by pi pi pulse and then if you apply we start you're back up to the other state so you're effectively interchanging the two states and you can represent that operation as this simple matrix, which is the Pauli X gate. And this is the logical representation 
of the knot gate in quantum mechanics, where the operator operates on any vector in the two-dimensional column. So that's the knot gate. But there's also operators, say, the square root of knot, which is the pi over 2 rotation, the rotation that gets you to the equator. And on the equator of the block sphere, you get an equal superposition of the two basis states. And that's the prelude to doing all the computation. Also, it's very important that when you trigger another pulse, it's coherent you know ex uh, with respect to the intrinsic clock of the qubit it turns out that the relative phase of any state of the qubit is changing at the rate at the frequency of the transition itself so the precise phase when the same pulse here it again will determine whether you're applying a rotation around x y or some other axis that is also why microwave sources, we have to make sure that they're, they're pure as, as much as possible because phase noise will cause a, a jitter in the phase here and we won't rotate the way we want to rotate and we will get errors and errors are bad for com uh, computing. Now, if we imagine applying a pulse at red, for different lengths of time, but for each time, starting with a small time from the initialization of the state at zero, we then make a measurement and we can get zero or one. As long as we're not right at zero, we can get zero or one. We don't know, but there's a probability that we'll uh, get zero or one. And by making many measurements, we'll get a red dot here. So if the time, or the duration of this pulse before we make the measurement is short, we've started out close to here. The uh, angle since we in the parameterization is close to zero. The probability of getting a one is very small. So we're, we're always close to zero. But as we make a measurement for longer times, when this pulse is applied, say green, there's a larger and larger chance that when we make a measurement of this, but again, we have each point here is an average of thousands of measurements. If you actually were to make measurements here, you'd get say half the time zero and one. And if we continue the pulse at the resonance frequency of the transition, we will trace out ideally this oscillation in probability of getting a one or a zero over time. And that's those are called Rabi oscillations. Now that's the ideal case. If the qubit were perfect, in reality, unfortunately, the superposition decays or decoheres. That's another big problem with real qubits. They don't last forever. In fact, they typically last on the order of these days, maybe 100 or 200 microseconds. That's really good. So the key challenge is to make sure that your qubit lives long enough such that with microwaves, you can perform the kinds of operations you want and enough of them to computation. So lifetimes are important for qubits, and, but just as important as their lifetime, it's how fast can you actually manipulate the states with your control signal. That's even more important. OK, so where does the power of quantum computation come? I've shown you the basics of qubits, how they're manipulated, but, but why is it so much more powerful? Well, that's kind of a deep and hard question, but here, here is one of the we, we talked about. A single qubit is a superposition of the two basis states. If we have two qubits, the state of a two qubit system is a superposition in four dimensions. Each dimension or each axis can be labeled by the states of the individual qubits. And for three qubits, 
it's an eight dimensional space and by induction it's the dimension is two to the n so the space of a quantum state of n qubits scales exponentially with the number of cu individual qubits that's completely different from a classical system classical system you have the position or momentum of each particle you add another particle uh, you just add the position and momentum of the next particle, and that defines the state of the composite. So, for example, just to make it clear how dramatically different that is, it's estimated that there are 10 to the 80th particles in the known universe. Well, in terms of number of qubits, you solve this equation. It says that there are more states available to a system of n qubits for 270 qubits than there are atoms in the universe. And that means, or as some people would say, if every atom in the universe were dedicated to classical computation, you could do as much with 270 quantum bits as a classical computer. Another way to, to talk about that is to say, if you have a computational state for n bits classically, you have one of two to the n states, just one. But a quantum state is an arbitrary superposition of all two to the n states. So you have that in dramatically large computational space at your disposal. Oh, I should uh, mention also that this recent demonstration of so-called quantum supremacy was done with 53 bits, uh, qubits that is, and actually 54, one of them didn't work. I should have mentioned when I showed you the cryostat that there was a problem with one of those cables. And the challenges of trying to repair such a device, meaning you have to open up the cryostat, pull it out, wait for it to warm up, find the problem, debugging all those cables, fixing it, putting it back in the cryostat was, was too much. So they basically just used 53 of the qubits. And that was an abstract, not very practical algorithm, but they were able to, to demonstrate a superior result with their quantum computer. Anyway, that's a story in its own right. All right, so we talked about the exponential scaling of the quantum space with qubit number. That's important in another respect, in particular, a property only of quantum systems called entanglement. So here is the general two qubit state. As we've seen, it's four dimensional. And here is a very simple example. So C1 is one or one over square root of two, and so is C4. Now this state is a well-defined state of a two qubit system, and it is so-called entanglement. Because if we measure this state, as we said, it has to collapse into one of the states. Now, there are four basis states. So if we measure one qubit and we find zero, then we know we've collapsed the state into zero, zero. If, on the other hand, we measure either qubit in the one state, it means this state has collapsed upon measurement into the one, one state. And if it's in the one, one state, for example, we know its partner has to be in the one state as well. Likewise, if we had measured zero, we know its partner has to be in the zero state. And so there are these super classical correlations in measurements, and we can predict the result of a measurement across the universe without even having to make it. So for example, if we can somehow entangle two qubits, qubit one and qubit two, and we send one of the qubits off across the universe, and then we measure qubit one, immediately and instantaneously, we here in our lab know with certainty what the measurement of qubit two would be or will be when measured by uh, somebody on the other side of the universe. And that's Einstein's spooky action at a distance, non-locality, and it's, it's fascinating and mind-bending. But it's more than just interesting. 
means it actually is, is a computational resource. Because remember, I told you only one classical bit of information is retrievable from a single qubit. It turns out that you can encode and retrieve two classical bits of information from a single qubit if it's part of an entangled pair. And with multiple qubits, the information can be distributed among them in this entangled form. Another interesting comment is again that unlike a classical system composed of two particles where this, each particle almost by definition can be considered to have its own state, in quantum mechanics here is a state of a two qubit system but neither constituent qubit can be said to have its own quantum state. That's a feature of entanglement. That we know how to manipulate our qubits. We know we need to, to do entangle, entangle them. How do we query them in, in a practical sense? And I showed you uh, the qubits and uh, coupling to a resonator. Here's a schematic of that. Uh, what is typically done is a microwave signal is sent in from the equipment going down through the layers of the cryostat and you query a, the resonator and you look for the resonance as a function of frequency and it turns out that due to the quantum mechanical interaction of the qubit and the resonator if you probe the resonator typically at let's say a gigahertz away from the resonant frequency of the qubit. So the qubit was maybe 10 gigahertz transition energy. The resonator designed to be say 11 gigahertz. The interaction between the qubit and the resonator quantum mechanically shifts the, reson the resonant frequency of the resonator. So by querying the resonator, you can infer what the state of the qubit was. And that's how you make a, a measurement of the qubit state. And effectively, what that means is that the state of the qubit is like a dielectric. And the dielectric changes as a function of the qubit state. So when you measure the readout resonator, you can infer through what the resonant frequency is, what the state of the qubit is. And again, this has to be done quickly before the qubit decoheres. All right, so let's shift briefly into the algorithm. Some slides from the MIT group. With a, a three qubit state to illustrate, I know there were eight of them, but there were only four of them shown in the picture here. And by doing the uh, pi over two pulses that we introduced earlier, we put individually into a superposition state. It's neglecting the normalization, a coherent superposition of all of say the eight basis states as a starting point. And then the next step of an algorithm is to put the microwave pulses or use different microwave pulses say, for each qubit where you change the coefficients of those states according to what your algorithm is. And then you let the probability amplitudes interfere. You close your eyes, you apply the pulses, and that will mix up through the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, the coefficients. Then you have to do these two qubit gates, which I didn't talk about, in order to entangle these qubits. That's important, but it's uh, more complicated than I can go into. And then there's more quantum interference. And in the end, and this is the G behind some of these algorithms, that you try to encode the solution into a particular but unknown basis vector. And if you write interference experiment, if you engender the interference such, such that in the end, one of the coefficients is approximately one, and the other coefficients therefore are close to zero. 
the sum of the square of the coefficients has to be one. And then you make a measurement, the overwhelming probability of getting the right answer happens when this coefficient is close to one. And then you make the measurement, that particular sequence bits that you retrieve is the answer. Fortunately, I can't give you a, a, a demonstration in, in, in the time for that, but it, it's, it's marvelous and it really is genius. So a typical hallmark of quantum algorithms is that they're probabilistic. So with a high degree of probability, you'll get the right answer. It's very easy to check. But unlike what I've read, it's absolutely not true that all quantum algorithms are probabilistic. There are some quantum algorithms that are in fact completely deterministic. You, you will always get a definite answer. In the end, a quantum algorithm is really nothing but a set of microwave pulses. So we have multiple qubits here. Each one has a line. This is a quantum circuit diagram. The little boxes on one line are the microwave pulses, basically, that do certain things. The X gate we talked about, it's that pi pulse. Uh, these other gates uh, manipulate states in slightly different ways. Any line or box connecting two or more qubits is a two or multi-particle gate that creates some kind of entanglement. Entanglement requires an interaction between two qubits or among multiple qubits. And to execute an algorithm, these pulses, as we mentioned before, have to be very carefully sequenced Highly coherent multi-channel signaling is required. And you have to make enough of these predefined, or they don't even have to be fully predefined, but sequenced coherent pulses across multiple channels to execute the algorithms in a quantum computation. And so again, the challenges are the qubits can decohere. You have to make sure you do enough operations to be useful while they still are working. The temperatures are very cold and there's still high error rates. Now there are, I guess we'll get to that, about how to correct errors, at least in principle, but uh, it's, it's nothing like uh, 10 to the minus 14 or 16 error rates in a classical computer, they're, they're down in, and to the minus four these days. And finally, there's the big challenge of error curve. So given those error rates, you need a high degree of redundancy to protect against errors. And there are all kinds of errors. There's error in readout, there's error in initialization. The, if the microwave pulses aren't precisely at the right frequency or triggered at the right point in time, or fully coherent, or the source has a phase noise on it, you will be rotating, for example, the quantum states to places you didn't intend to, and those errors will add up. And so typically what we do in all cases, classical and quantum, is we use redundancy to protect against errors. So for example, we can use three qubits, which can be different states, but we look at a subset where say they're all zero and all one and encode that lot three qubits using an obvious uh, mapping. And then if we can query a, a quantum state and we find a state like this, we know there was an error and we can correct it. So we can correct this state to one, 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 for example, and this state to zero. And without going through the details, it's possible using entanglement with some extra qubits and measuring only the extra qubits, the ancillas as they're called, we can locate and define and locate which qubit had an error without querying it. Because remember, if we query the qubit, we destroy the information that was uh, that it contained. We collapse the wave function but by collapsing only the part of the entanglement between 
extra qubits and the data qubits, we can infer the parity basically and know which qubit had an error and then trigger one of those other microwave pulses, an X gate or a Y gate that rotates around Y, for example, and correct the error without looking at the qubit itself. So that's very roughly how error correction works. But because the error rates are large, we need to trigger waveforms depending on our measurements. The measurements have to be made quickly. Pulses have to be sent out quickly, coherently to the channel that has the qubit that had the error. So a lot of real-time decision-making and fast feedback is important. And typically now, the redundancy between the physical qubits that we need for a good logical qubit is on the order of a thousand. So clearly that's not practical yet, but so that's one of the big enduring challenges that the people pursuing practical quantum computation need to overcome. But so that kind of summarizes the talk. And I do want to emphasize that I hope it's clear that microwaves are really the sweet spot of the quantum modality. So we talked about superconducting qubits, but there are spins also that uh, work at tip of the, those kind of microwave frequencies, also very cold. There are others that are, uh, that are optical, like uh, trapped ions, et cetera. Waves are really the predominant control mechanism for we're the most practical system so far, with the possible exception of photons. Microwaves and microwave engineering, designing the chips, which are microwave chips, with good cavities, which we didn't really talk about, a simulation, electromag classical electromagnetic simulation, planar microwave analysis are key to designing uh, qubit chips that are practical. And then fast feedback, highly coherent multi-channel systems of microwave control is a real key aspect to making successful commercial and practical enterprise. Milestones like the quantum advantage demonstration continue to be made. Significant progress is happening. Dramatic increase in funding over the last many years. And within the, the IEEE and other communities, there's an explosion of this new field called quantum engineering. It's interdisciplinary. There's mathematics, computer science, physics, microwave engineering, and a fascinating, interesting time to be working in this field. I want to thank you for your attention and remind people that the IEEE is heavily involved. There is a, a quantum conference. The Here's the URL. This is scheduled to occur in October. And I encourage you to explore this, the other involvement of IEEE in this fascinating field. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'll do my best to answer questions if there are any. Or you can always email me. And I will endeavor to get back to you. So thanks again. Okay, David, thank you very much for this interesting talk. It was very, very interesting. And hopefully, I think it will be motivated also for, for new people to, in, to join this area of quantum computing. And I will now open the session for questions. So if you have any, you can either <coughs> your microphone or you can put the questions in the question and answer or chat whatever you prefer. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can hear you. Yeah, my name is Sai. I have a question for Dr. David Root. Uh, actually, a question and a comment. Uh, the first, uh, the question was, the equation you showed for the quantum states, is that a direct uh, uh, cat vector equation? 
Let's see. Uh, the this two the states one? that you showed, the, you know, this one, the zero and one. Is that a ket vector? Yes. So psi is a ket vector. It and it yeah, typically uh, yes. right. Yes. Okay. So now the uh, the classical form, like a Hamiltonian type of uh, equation, will not work. I guess. The Hamiltonian, what's so nice about quantum mechanics is, well, like classical mechanics, there's Newton's law, so you can derive classical equations of motion using Newton's law or electromagnetics, but you can use Hamilton's equations to get the classical equations, and you can use Lagrange's equations. Quantum right. mechanics can be, uh, you, you quantum mechanics solutions by the Schrodinger equation or right. inversion. So, so it, it, it actually goes over. Yes. Yeah, so Hamil the Hamiltonian is the same basically, but right. there's a between the classical dynamical variables and the quantum mechanical options that represent dynamical variables in quantum mechanics. But yeah, the Hamil yeah, the Hamiltonian formulation work fine. Okay, and uh, the other uh, uh, qu question on that was that uh, the in quantum mechanics, in theory at least, you can have uh, non-degenerate states of uh, uh, you know particles. Can uh, uh, would that help uh, in uh, uh, be being able to uh, make this uh, qubit system more uh, uh, measurable or more uh, efficient if we can get known, uh, only non-degenerate states of uh, any particle system. Actually, yes. It's it's the fact that these two states are non-degenerate. So oh, a degenerate okay. state would be multiple state same energy. So almost by definition, a qubit is a system with different energy. Now, you don't have to have different energy. So for example, if you have photons as your qubit, you can have the two states being different polarizations. Right. Like so the, in that case, uh, the spin quantum could be one or two states of an electron. Well, an electron is a spin a half. Right. It's it's uh, angular momentum or it's spin angular momentum right. can have only two values, of, exactly. say, up or down. So that so so a two state system, a very ideal an electron, right, in a magnetic field. Right. Um, you, you can at a photon, not just polarization. It turns out you can make a qubit out of photons of different energies. So there are all kinds of wonderful things you can do. Some are degenerate, like, like a photon of the same energy with different polarization. Most of the time, most of the systems are non-degenerate two levels, approximately two level systems that have different energies. Right. And I have one comment, uh, I have, done some work with another company in supplying some microwave products for quantum computing. And the difficulty is that so far, the semiconductors that work at cryo states are especially for oscillator or amplifier are rather very limited. And that makes designing microwave comp components for quantum computing uh, a lot more difficult, especially for low noise type applications. That's a very good point. There's a, there's a huge opportunity to improve the electronics for, for quantum. And uh, probably is done, say, at, at, in Europe at, the, say, the Technical University of Delft, using uh, cryogenic CMOS devices, 
that can work down at four Kelvin and maybe slightly lower. Right. So even though the uh, quantum processor has to work in millikelvin, exactly. the electronics can be sort of placed lower in the crop. So that's an important trend. In terms of other microwave components, uh, hemp's are used to uh, for amplification, not not at the millikelvin level certainly, or even the four Kelvin, but low noise amplification is critical. There are Josephson junction based traveling wave amplifiers, nearly quantum limited amplifiers that are necessary. I didn't show you the details of the of some of the plumbing with amplifiers, circulators are needed. So th there's a huge there's a huge opportunity for contributions for some of these uh, critical components to make to make the electronics work. So that's a very right. important comment. Thank you for making it. Okay, thank you very much for. for thank you very question. much. I have I have a question in in the chat. So someone is asking if you have to recommend a book for beginners on quantum computing. If yes. you have uh, any suggestion. Yes, I do, and I didn't have the time to go into that. I I can if you I can send you a, a list with the detail, but. I, I want to emphasize that microwave engineers who know just the tiny bit of linear algebra, which you do for matrices, it, it, it's quite possible to learn this stuff fundamentally based on a standard microwave engineer's background, I think. So, I mean, off the top of my head, there's a book by Leonard Susskind. Actually, let me pull it from my shelf here. It's called uh, Quantum Mechanics, The Theoretical Minimum by Susskind, S-U-S-S-K-I-N-D. It has one of the most lucid, correct, uh, but elementary treatments of qubits, basically. It's very, very readable. And I guess I would start with that, but please uh, send me an email and I'll provide you a list because I've developed internal classes for Keysight and recommend that book along with, with others. Uh, okay. There's a, a great deal of educational work being considered by the IEEE as well as uh, many of the other agencies because it's it's, clear that there's a need to educate the workforce. Uh, physicists need to understand more microwave engineers, uh, engineering, but microwave engineers need to understand more of the physics. And I find that personally quite interesting. And it's exciting. And I think uh, most microwave engineers have the tools uh, to pick this up. Thank you very much. So sure. time for one more question. Is anyone else? If not, thank you very much, David, again, for this amazing talk. And uh, we'll continue our chapter share meeting at this stage. Thank you very much, David. Thank you all. Thank My you. pleasure.